Hi, I'm Esther. And I'm Sean. I write about AI news here at Tech Target in Massachusetts. And I edit Esther's stories. We're here to talk with tech experts about everything AI and chat GPT. Don't forget Google Gemini. Whether it's who's ahead in the generative AI race, the metaverse, digital twins, or even the latest in autonomous vehicles, we've got it covered. Right, Sean? Yep, we've got it covered. Everyone, we're back once again on another episode of the Targeting AI podcast. This time around, our guest is CEO and founder of RPA2 AI Research, Kashap Kampela. As an award-winning analyst, Kashap has been leading RPA2 AI for about six years now. He's also an analyst for Real Story Group and visiting professor for BITS School of Management. Thank you so much for joining us, Kashap. We really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to chat with you and Sean. Hey, Kashyap. Perfect. How are you doing? So in 2023, we saw an explosion of AI systems with generative AI, such as ChatGPT and more. How do you think this will change in 2024? Great. I think that that's great to kick off our discussion. So I think uh, it's the Oxford Dictionary or somebody who said uh, the word of the year is Riz, as in charisma. But I think it should have been uh, ChatGPT. That has been uh, the extent of uh, hype and interest, uh, unprecedented interest, I would say, in any AI application in recent times or, or, or ever. So my guess is that the hype will cool a bit, but there is going to be continued interest uh, through 2024 in uh, AI and generative AI in particular. So I see four broad themes. I mean, we can discuss uh, this in detail later on. But the burst of technological innovation that we saw, that will continue. We'll see multi-model, large language models, open source models, small models, not just large language models, but small language models, even more models that can work on mobile devices, domain-specific models, and so on. So this burst of innovation will uh, continue. So if we think about it, uh, 2023 really was uh, the year of shock and awe for uh, AI technology. But uh, I think in 2024, there is going to be some amount of focus if not sole focus on uh, return on investment. If you think about it, uh, the only companies that are making money on AI at this point in time are NVIDIA and maybe AI consulting companies. So everybody is uh, still in that investment phase hoping to hit pay dirt. So that's from the technology companies or the AI vendors. But the businesses and the organizations that are looking to implement uh, AI systems, they're going to be also focused on uh, business value and uh, return on investment. Lastly, the rules of engagement uh, around uh, using generative AI systems, that will continue to be defined, that will have to be defined. You saw that there is a lot of uh, litigation around uh, using uh, generative AI systems. I mean, everybody from uh, Sarah Silverman to John Grisham to New York Times uh, have sued different (laughs) AI companies uh, for copyright infringements. So businesses are going to be or sort of becoming aware of the risks of some of the risks of using the AI systems. So we'll see more indemnity clauses uh, being offered by AI vendors, but more broadly, the rules of engagement for these uh, systems have to be defined. So I think that that's what's going to define the landscape of generative AI going in 2024 and going forward. To what extent are we seeing an AI hangover? You know, uh, the market has been down the first two days of the new year. Tech stocks have been down, NVIDIA is down, AMD is down, everybody's down. Um, so to what extent do the, do the market sort of get ahead of itself? We're talking about the uh, investment side of AI. Correct. I think uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a hangover as such, but it's a sort of a temporary blip. We're coming off the highs of, uh, or maybe some of the irrational hype of the last year. But if you look at the data, about a quarter of the VC investments uh, that uh, were made in 2023 went into generative AI systems. And generative AI companies are uh, actually gaining bigger rounds. I mean, so, so I think uh, there is a lot of interest. And the early pilots, I wouldn't say there have been a lot of at scale projects, but the early pilots when it comes to enterprises, they have shown some interesting uh, results. So like I said, there is going to be continued interest, but the stock market valuations, I think uh, there is going to be some reset in terms of the technology sector because the valuations may have uh, run ahead of uh, fundamentals in uh, many cases. And it's probably going to be like 
uh, an economy wide correction given that a lot of it is dependent on a lot of future looking investments are based on the interest rate environment which could be changing so it it all depends and it's really tough to see where this is going to go i want to ask if you can just uh, perhaps just speak a little bit about what you meant by rules of engagement right and you were speaking about the business value and um i like what you said about a lot of times right now a lot of uh, the vendors are not really gaining or seeing the real value or seeing the real profit from generative ai and so how do you think businesses can start to see that value, right? Because we still have, I mean, sure, NVIDIA is one of the ones that's winning, but we also have OpenAI, which is like valued right now to over $80 billion, right? So they are probably seeing the money because they are the creators of this system. But the enterprises, um, how can they begin to see the value? What will change to make them start to see that value? So that, that's a fairly interesting question. Th- there is a saying in the world of marketing and advertising, which says, uh, 50% of the money I spend on uh, advertisement is wasted. The problem is that I don't know which 50%. So I have a suspicion that holds for uh, investments that uh, enterprises are making in AI. I've been looking at some data. So Gartner has been coming out with this data since uh, 2017 or so, if I remember. So in 2017, they predict or they saw that uh, less than 50% of the AI projects make it to production. In 2019, they gain uh, repeated the same finding. Less than 50% of the AI projects are making to production. The same story in 2021. So if you think about it, like if only 50% of the AI projects are making to production, so that means uh, that 50% of the money that uh, enterprises and businesses are spending on AI is wasted. So it, it's uh, my hunch is that it's not going to be very different when it comes to generative AI as well. And we can discuss what are the reasons uh, and uh, what are the reasons? And broadly, the reasons are uh, th- th- that uh, companies are not organized to take uh, advantage of uh, AI in terms of uh, having the right data sets. Most of the enterprise data is in uh, silos. So, so companies are grappling with that. The next is around the availability of uh, the skilled resources. AI talent uh, continues to be in uh, short supply. So except uh, if you're a Tilco- Silicon Valley tech major, who's able to quote these uh, very highly in-demand talent, that that's uh, a problem. And the third thing is the pace of adoption of technology for a regular enterprise is rather slow. That's the reasons why we see like uh, a lot of the AI investments uh, taking time to materialize and also taking time to fructify. Would you say that another reason is this engagement between the business and the tech side? I think uh, when it comes to generative AI particularly, th- that that disconnect was there between business and tech when it comes to the previous uh, year's uh, deep learning systems. But when it comes to generative AI, I, I see that uh, business uh, is a leading uh, technology when it comes to adoption. So in the f- previous years, we saw something known as shadow IT, right? Where uh, business was bringing in a lot of uh, tech tools uh, that IT did not approve. So it, there is some data that a survey that uh, the vendor Salesforce has put out, which shows that uh, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but roughly it says that uh, a third of the enterprises have uh, banned uh, the use of generative AI systems. Uh, but still, even in those organizations where there has been an explicit ban on usage of generative AI systems for reasons of uh, risk and security, etc. About uh, half the employees uh, still report using uh, generative AI systems. That disconnect between business and technology, we, we again uh, see, but in a different fashion this time. Business is really very interested in uh, using these tools because this is the first time that somebody has uh, gotten their hands on such a powerful technology. To take a step back, for example, the generative AI technology itself is not new. Transformers, the architectures or the technology that powers generative AI, like chat GPT, et cetera, that has been uh, introduced in 2017, so six years ago. The first version of GPT-1 was released in 2018. GPT-3, a more capable version, was released in 2020. And I remember I filed three of my columns for different outlets as a, a demonstration or a demo of uh, GPT-3 capabilities that its writing capabilities uh, were so good. So this was in like uh, 2020. But, but but really, ChatGPT released uh, a year ago, roughly, that has been the tipping point for AI because 
a lot of the public, the general public, actually got their hands dirty with using the system or seeing the capabilities of the system. So that's uh, really like some of the undercurrents of where uh, we're going in 2024 with AI. Everybody has sort of tasted blood and see and now want to see how they can uh, put that capability use in whichever organization they're in. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned that point about users using the uh, generative AI systems, whether they're allowed to or not. Esther identified that as a, as a trend for 24 in uh, bring your own AI. So uh, bring your own device and bring your own AI is, I think, that definitely going to happen. Um, so Kashyap, you recently spoke and wrote about how generative AI is both smart and stupid. So how can it get less stupid in 2024? <laughs> so, yeah. So this is not me who, who, who's uh, said that. It's uh, John Oliver, the comedian and TV host, uh, who said that the problem with AI right now isn't that it isn't smart, but it's that it's stupid in ways that we can't uh, always predict. That that's <laughs> John Oliver's take, I think, which is pretty perceptive. So I said that uh, chat GPT should have been uh, the word of the year, but, but probably a close contender should have been hallucinations. So there are, I mean, uh, <clears throat> deep uh, rooted uh, disagreements on whether uh, the current LLMs that we have can ever be prevented from hallucinating because of, the underly of their underlying architecture, because they're uh, in some ways next word prediction systems or stochastic parrots, as somebody has called it. I mean, I don't think they're stochastic parrots. They're more capable uh, than that. But uh, Jan Lekun, uh, the AI head at Meta, says that uh, what we have are language models. What we really need are uh, world models, models that understand, models that we can depend on for reasoning, for planning, etc. So that's, that's beyond my pay grade to see, like, how can we reduce hallucinations? Because, I mean, the, the, these are like uh, pioneers of uh, deep learning and uh, generative AI that, that are having these no-holds-barred discussions whether this can be, in effect, be achieved or not. So that, that's one thing. But having said that, what, what have I seen enterprises trying to do? Enterprises have been trying to put guardrails around uh, what is uh, permissible in the output of an AI system, what is not permit permissible in the output of an AI system. So there is an approach called... Uh, constitutional AI, for example, which says, can we write a constitution for AI? This is popularized by one of the AI vendors called Anthropic. The To step back a bit, the way the current systems like ChatGPT have been trained, it uses a technique called a reinforcement learning from human feedback or RLHF. So what it entails is you take about uh, 50,000 examples of question answer pairs and ask humans to rate those uh, what's acceptable, what is not acceptable, etc. And that is fed into the system. But if you think about it, this approach does not scale. But instead of that, can we use, uh, instead of RLHF, that is reinforcement learning from human feedback, can we use reinforcement learning from AI systems? So that approach sort of uh, lends itself to more scale and you can easily incorporate more easily, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say easily, but more easily compared to RLHF, incorporate uh, say, locale specific or location specific differences, some regulatory requirements, maybe even guardrails that are aligned to your corporate values. So that is one approach. Another approach is, uh, I think, I mean, you, you see, whenever there is a controversy, you see chat GPT clamping down on certain things. Like, for example, if you ask chat GPT some questions about uh, controversial topics or to generate images that are copyrighted, it flat out refuses. So these are all rules that are being a uh, layer of rules that are being imposed. So those are some of the ways in which guardrails can be put. But can we ever uh, stop it from, uh, from uh, say, hallucinating or making it uh, completely accurate factually? That, that's different. Like what Twitter is trying to do, for example, Twitter's model of Grok. If you use ChatGPT, you find that, okay, I don't have access to real uh, time data. But Grok says we, we are going to sort of access uh, real-time Twitter data and answer questions on that. So that, that's another approach of these things. So, so there are multiple approaches being uh, trialed. But like as I said, it, it's tough to say whether we'll ever be at a stage where this, we are going to be 
making it uh, completely 100% reliable. There are different approaches. I mean, I'll talk about it, a couple of other approaches at a later point. But uh, these are all like, I mean, different. Uh, see, I, I think at this point in time, at this point of evolution of uh, this technology, everybody is making educated guesses as to what is the approach that will finally prevail, whether uh, we'll be able to iron out some of the limitations and wrinkles that we currently see. So I find it interesting because all you're talking about is how do we make this generative AI kind of like responsible, right? And you're talking about ways that businesses and enterprises are trying to to do that. I want to kind of take a step back um, because you mentioned like, obviously there are some businesses that are kind of trying to marry the two of like, how do we allow our employees to um, use this technology, but also not... Um, I guess, misuse this technology. What are you finding within those organizations, right? Where there is that tension? Because like Sean said, um, I, I think I spoke to uh, Gartner or Forrester and they were like, well, a lot of employees are using it anyway. So it's kind of like a losing battle. Um, so how do they fix that exactly? I found the survey I referred to. So let me give some statistics around that. This is a survey by Salesforce, which says uh, about 28% of uh, workers are currently using generative AI at work, and half of these are doing so without the approval of their employees. So some of the interesting facets of this survey is that 64% of those have passed off uh, generative AI work as their own, and 40% uh, of workers say that they would overstate their generative AI skills for advancing uh, at work or for uh, additional opportunities. So that's uh, interesting. So, for, for example, there are a lot of uh, documented uh, what is it, stories that have come out which said how corporate secrets could potentially be leaking out when you use a, a tool like ChatGPT or how there are some reservations around the data that you're putting in. Is that going to be used uh, for further training, etc.? So the first step is to put a corporate policy around uh, acceptable usage and what is acceptable usage, what is not acceptable usage of uh, AI generative AI systems. I find that less than 10% of the companies currently have uh, a defined uh, generative AI policy. Like, like we have an information security policy, right? All, all organizations have that, but we don't have, uh, what do you say, what's the uh, policy for generative AI? The old joke is that uh, the dog ate the homework, but uh, it's chat GPT which ate the homework. So I teach at a lot of institutions and this is particularly relevant. I mean, businesses, yes, but for academic institutions, you, you need to clearly define. There is a, a tension out there. Do, you, do we need to equip our students uh, with the tools that they're going to use in the real world, such as ChatGPT? Or do we need to sort of ban uh, tools like ChatGPT when they complete their assignments? So again, a lot of the institutions are uh, divided on what uh, should be the right uh, thing. So, so change change will come but but i think uh, this raises deeper questions of what is the purpose of uh, education in the academic context so what are we teaching our students uh, what is acceptable use what is not acceptable use similar considerations have to be weighed upon in terms of uh, what is acceptable use what is not acceptable use of course the the framework that we use like not to leak corporate data not to sort of uh, sully your brand when you make inappropriate use, etc. Those are different, but, but fundamentally, that is the first step. Increasing the AI literacy of uh, the employees or the students, and then uh, based on that, uh, equipping them by providing uh, clear guidelines of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So that, that's okay. the first step you would think, right? Okay, so following up on this notion of responsible AI, um, a lot of people saw that what, what happened with um, open AI as a battle between the, you know, those who would push a, uh, generative AI development as fast as possible and those who would seek to limit it and uh, regulate it. And that was the board who was the, the reformists and Sam Altman kind of representing the uh, accelerate uh, faction. And then I see this kind of division between the, the doom faction and then the all systems go faction. So how do you see that tension playing out over the next couple of years? So th this is a quite an interesting thing because I've been interested in the field of AI ethics or responsible AI for at least uh, six, seven years now, or maybe six years. So with the advent of large language models, what we were calling uh, responsible AI has uh, 
sort of uh, divided into AI risks. The notion of AI acceleration that you mentioned. So a lot of the people who, who are talking about AI acceleration or we shouldn't accelerate AI, some of them are also worried about hypothetical risks like extinction. You'd remember uh, opinion piece in the magazine Time in which one of the gurus said that we should uh, bomb uh, the data centers in which these large language models are being trained. So, so I- I'm more of the view that let us address the clear and present current dangers of AI. Maybe there, there is a small non-zero risk of human extinction and such catastrophic risks at some point in time. But at the same time, we also have... Uh, I mean, right in front of our eyes, a lot of harms that are being done because of the rushed implementation of AI. There are ways, I mean, if we put our minds to it, there are ways in which uh, we could address these uh, clear and present uh, risks. And also, it's tricky in terms of uh, putting a pause. Uh, last year, I think there was also a letter where a lot of the leading lights said that let's pause further AI research for six months. That's more a symbolic uh, gesture. Because it, just because if AI research is stopped in one country, it doesn't mean that other countries are going to sort of uh, stop it as well. So we're never going to be in a situation where we have any sort of global consensus saying we're not going to do, not, not for AI, not for anything. So it, that, that's probably distracting us from the clear work that, that we have in terms of making AI more responsible. Do you think that part of the issue may be the fact that um, there, it's not explainable, right? Do you think that part of the reason that we have AI risk that we have, like you mentioned the letter last year about uh, let's pause a, uh, this development, let's ha- it's going to cause an extinction or it's going to affect the nu- bet worse than a nuclear weapon. Is it because of the lack of explainability with models like chat GPT or BARD or stuff like that? And the fact that um, this is also going into open versus closed source models, but we saw this, like basically this rise last year of open source models. And you're seeing it now um, with the excitement around Apple and all of that. Absolutely. It's, it's quite interesting because uh, the, the term artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy in 1956, like one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. So he, he envisaged uh, AI systems as like programs with common sense and Transparency was uh, like the original design goal in 1956. And the term, but the term explainable AI itself has been coined around 20 years ago. It's not like relatively new. And like you said, as models like ChatGPT are getting in bigger and bigger, can any of us confidently say that we know how an AI system really works, right? And trust, trust is like the currency of modern societies and economies. And AI or any technology, for example, we need to trust. Trust in the technology is like a prerequisite for adoption. But if you don't know the underlying details of how AI works, I mean, if it's a black box, it, it's going to slow down the adoption of uh, technology. So this field of explainable AI hopes to make AI systems more transparent and understandable by, by, by sort of uh, throwing light on the black inside, shining a light inside of this uh, black model of how certain decisions are arrived at, etc. So broadly, I mean, we would like for, for larger adoption, particularly in high stakes use cases, like, like the, these would be applications in finance, applications in healthcare, applications in the legal arena or criminal justice, etc. So what are the main factors or features used in a decision taken by the AI? And what is the specific decision that is taken by the AI and why? What is the underlying logical model that is being followed by the AI? So all of these uh, are really very important. And unless uh, we are comfortable with that, in the last five, six years, what has happened is we have a lot of, uh, I mean, I've seen this uh, in first quarters, close quarters. There are highly performant deep learning systems, but they're not uh, easily understood by different stakeholders. So businesses have uh, not pushed them to production. I talked earlier about uh, a lot of the AI projects not making to production. It's also because of this thing. Because of lack of explainability, companies have uh, just resorted to deploying simpler models like decision trees or linear models in finance, in healthcare, etc. So that, that, that's where we're at. And explainability is also important. In fact, I call explainability the X factor for AI success. New York City, for example, since uh, July 15th of last year, has mandated a third-party independent audit of uh, AI systems that are used for uh, 
HR, hiring and recruitment, etc. So to be able to comply with that regulation for independent audits, etc., explainability makes matters so much easier. So, so unless we crack explainability, it, it's really going to be tough for people. I mean, you use, uh, like, let's say, if you take an example of a diagnostic uh, for cancer screening for patients that's uh, based on clinical data, that's based on biomarkers, genomic data, etc. Even if it's highly performant, if it spews out a prediction saying, okay, 70% cancer, 70% cancer probability, how would a doctor take that and explain it to the patient that, okay, you're diagnosed with a specific type of cancer because of this thing? So, so high stakes and medium stakes applications, they're being held back because of this lack of explainability. And large language models, like we still haven't cracked how to make them uh, more explainable because uh, they're highly performant and with a lot of emergent capabilities, but uh, it's an unsolved problem as of now. Okay, so I, one thing uh, I wanted to ask you about is um, I'm a sports fan, so I like watching the uh, AI arms race. Who's ahead this week? And so some people I've talked to and Esther has talked to says, no one can win the AI arms race. They're all just pushing ahead. But you do see Microsoft and OpenAI come out with a big thing, and then Google comes out with a Gemini, and then Claude comes out with Claude 19 or whatever it is. Um, what's going on there? Do you think Microsoft and Google take this seriously? Like, is this a matter of like corporate pride that they stay ahead uh, in the arms race? And then do you see maybe Meta, you know, standing on the sidelines and just and more in the open source world, and then you have uh, AWS too getting in the game. How do all those players uh, sort themselves out over the next couple of years? Absolutely. That's a trillion dollar question, actually. <laughs> so let, let's uh, first take the characteristics of the enterprise market, which I, I track. So how does any typical enterprise use new technology? What's the path uh, of adoption of technology? It's via their existing large enterprise vendors, through your ERP vendor, through your uh, CRM vendor through your other enterprise system vendor. So ultimately, in the steady, when steady state is re reached in a, right now this is a period of like uh, extreme innovation, but in the steady state in the next uh, two, three years, three to five year time frame, enterprises are going to be consuming uh, generative AI and other AI capabilities through the clouds. So you see like, uh, so what's going to happen in 2024 and going forward, we talked a little bit about this. A lot of these generative AI capabilities are going to be popping up in your word processing software, in your spreadsheets, in your presentation software, and in your as co-pilots. So again, <clears throat> in software, uh, we've always talked about uh, distribution and product and distribution trumping product. So that dynamic is going to pay up, play out here as well. So companies, uh, <clears throat> so if we talk about Microsoft, for example, Microsoft is very well positioned to tap into this uh, huge opportunity because they have access to the technology through OpenAI and uh, they also have enterprise relationships and distributions when it comes to enterprise business. For Google, it's uh, a very different uh, existential question because a lot of the companies, a lot of the folks are for the first time expressing dissatisfaction in Google search results. And it's a matter of business strategy for them because Google, if, if you make money based on whether I click on ad or not, whether I click on a particular Google result or not, versus you already give me a specific uh, pre-formatted uh, response, I don't have to go visit those websites. So that's a question of a business model innovation. They need to figure out uh, what... Uh, so there's a company called perplexity.ai, which is being touted as a Google killer or a like Google... I, I don't think so yet, but... Uh, so that's an emerging model of search. So that's uh, the characteristic of there. So Facebook, for example, is well positioned. I think uh, I really appreciate them for uh, being the leaders, uh, not 100% open source, but at least uh, open source to the some extent <clears throat> from a large company. So that, that really is uh, helping us. Uh, like I, I have uh, on my laptop installed uh, a variant of uh, Meta's uh, LLM and able to run it. 
and try out a few different things. Some of the questions that we talked about security, some of the questions that we talked about, can we reduce hallucinations, etc. I'm able to do it. People like me are able to do it so much more easily because of uh, companies like Meta releasing that as an open source instead of having to figure that out. So Meta, I think, uh, has also come out with their uh, glasses in partnership with uh, Reban and implemented uh, a chat uh, GPT like of a version, their version of that on that. So it's uh, an interesting form factor. Lots of uh, questions around privacy, particularly because it is Meta who already is uh, has a lot of clouds swirling uh, over it for privacy issues. So that's the thing. So in that sense, it is uh, going to be very company specific. But the incumbents, I would say, are really in a very good position to capture this opportunity compared to the smaller innovative startups because this is like very resource intensive deep pocket game another example i'll bring to you is like adobe so when it comes to generative ai in images adobe already has like existing assets of a, a stock library so they're able to train uh, their models on their own copyrighted material without having to ha- having to run into these copyright issues like other uh, vendors but uh, for, for for independent developers, for people who are okay with uh, experimenting and edginess, there are other models like, say, stability or mid-journey, etc. So, so this is going to be very interesting. And this is like, I think, uh, in our earlier conversation, we discussed this is the next trillion dollar opportunity that uh, companies are uh, trying to capture. Because even if the co-pilot is like $20 per month per user per seat, the costs for a large organization are going to add up quite quickly. So we are talking about um, individual companies and who's coming ahead, but now I kind of want to switch to uh, government organizations and the U.S. and different countries. And I know you follow that. So how do would you say the U.S. stands when it comes to AI compared to China, the U.K. and all of that other countries? Okay. So from a technology point of view, the U.S. is like the undisputed leader. So, so this this also goes back to the kind of regulatory approaches uh, that different countries are taking. So if we want to talk about regulation, because that like I talked about the rules of engagement being defined, broadly, there are uh, three approaches that, that you can say that most of the countries are, uh, you, you could categorize the regulatory responses of different countries. Countries like the UK and India and Israel, <laughs> they're sort of saying it'll be a light regulation. We are going to be hands-off when it comes to regulation. We'll rely on existing uh, laws, existing regulation, rather than coming up with AI-specific regulations. So that's uh, one approach. While there are the other approach are countries like uh, China, <clears throat> which say we're going to ban specific services. So China, is, Ch- China has, by the way, some excellent uh, AI models of their own, but 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 they operate in their own ecosystem rather than they don't export those to anybody or make available to anybody outside of uh, this you know, sphere. But they've banned specific services, etc. They've also imposed certain rules and regulations on how recommendation algorithms should behave, not generative AI, but recommendation algorithms also should behave. So, so that's... Uh, and if you want to release an LLM in China, you have to first uh, get it approved by the state regulator because they're a little more touchy and sensitive in terms of the output, that it doesn't say something that is not approved or that's not the party line. The EU is like very specific in terms of the regulation, right? I mean, they, they sort of, uh, it, it's quite interesting how the space moves so fast and EU's efforts uh, illustrate the difficulties of regulating this space. EU's AI Act, the much talked about uh, regulation, for, has been in the works for the last three years. And then when they were almost close to the finish line, then suddenly ChatGPT got released and the framework did not address this. So it was in the work for two years with like lots of intense discussions and whatnot. Suddenly ChatGPT burst onto the scene. And then again, that, that had to be retrofitted into that or included into that restriction. But, but they've passed it and in the next two years, companies have to be doing it. So I want to call, and the US is, right now, I mean, I think it's a mix between some AI-specific legislative frameworks and a laissez-faire approach. So it's a hybrid approach that the U.S. has uh, taken. So I I sort of am torn between what's the best way to regulate uh, AI. If you look at uh, the number of unicorns in the world, like if you take that as an indicator of uh, the vibrancy of uh, the technology sector, 
I think uh, as of uh, January 2024, we have about 1,350 unicorns or companies that are valued, private startups or private technology companies, startups that are valued over a billion. About 52%, the majority of them are US-based. And Europe has less than 10% of the overall, probably about 130 to 150 unicorns. So while Europe's regulatory first approach is sort of throttling the technology sector of Europe, that, that's my opinion. At, at the same time, uh, but, but, but that's probably the aligned to what the European consumers and citizens want. In uh, the US, I don't think there is going to be a federal level law because before we rush to regulate, my opinion is that uh, we should uh, first check whether uh, existing consumer protection laws suffice or not. Or can we mandate things like independent audit of AI systems, which we do in the financial, in the finance space, corporate finance space, we get like statements of uh, balance sheet and p &L statements of uh, companies audited. Can we do that for AI audits? Do we need to have a very sort of uh, onerous uh, regulation? For, for example, if you have space, state specific regulation, Illinois has certain regulation, New York has certain regulation, California has certain regulation. It imposes that much burden on uh, the companies. And <laughs> is that like uh, killing the goose that lays the golden egg? Because the US uh, definitely is the leader when it comes to AI technology currently. So I, I'm again, so I mean, I, I, I'm not like a, a partisan saying that you should regulate or you should not regulate for, for the various reasons that I've outlined here. I'm sort of conflicted about this. At the same time, I see a lot of uh, overhyping of the AI capabilities, a lot of uh, unfinished products being released and a lot of harm coming out of it. So uh, I think before we regulate, we should get all our uh, policymakers and regulators AI fluent. I think there is a 72-year-old uh, congressman uh, who's doing an AI course, a two-year AI course in, I think, George Washington University. So now I would like that gentleman to make AI regulation well-informed. Otherwise, we end up uh, regulating for a technology that doesn't exist or like, hypothetical technology. I find it really interesting that you said, like, I think you said that UK is kind of light on regulation and basically following existing laws. But, um, and then you, I, I think this is the first time I've heard the perspective of that, like, having that kind of different sectors or different states doing their own regulation that kind of puts the burden on the uh on the companies themselves so do you think that how is that necessarily a good thing because without the federal regulation then it kind of becomes like well i can regulate i cannot regulate i might just operate in this state and not in the states that require regulations and stuff like that the first question to ask is uh, can we trust the industry to self-regulate I think uh, the answer uh, going by sort of all the governance hullabaloo around open AI companies like that shows that maybe we, we, we should not trust them to self-regulate because that's exactly what industry would want. But the next thing would be to say, does the FCC, the FTC, the existing uh, regulatory architecture that we have, does it already have laws that we can uh, implement? Because like, let's say, if you're talking about autonomous vehicles, for example, do existing consumer uh, safety regulations, passenger safety regulations or road safety rules suffice for this or do we need additional regulation? So sector by sector, it should be able to understand, we should be able to figure out uh, what are the rules that exist or what are the rules that don't exist. For example, employment discrimination. I know, I mean, there is a EEOC, right? The Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Act. There is the Americans with Disability Act. For example, do we need independent audit of AI systems specifically for HR systems? Or is the harm that we are thinking that's going to happen covered by these specific regulation already? So that, that's something that I don't think has been adequately done, analyzed as yet. So once that is done, the, the answers to these become real clear. But, but again, I mean, US currently doesn't have a data privacy law. Right. I mean, it doesn't have a data privacy law at the federal level. There is also, I mean, the menace of robocallers, which, which was only addressed fairly recently. I'm sure like uh, both of you would have been at the receiving end of uh, <laughs> some robocall, automated robocallers. <clears throat> so, so it's not just uh, in the realm of uh, AI 
but but in the adjacent areas around data privacy etc you there is no federal law in the united states so because regulation is a tax once you put in uh, regulation it really becomes uh, difficult to get rid of it so the sarbanes oxley act which was uh, brought in uh, maybe 20 years ago 25 years ago many provisions of that were uh, watered down it took 20 years for those things to be watered down at some point so it, it's a trade off and uh, depending on public sentiment depending on the prevailing attitudes it swings from one extreme to the other so if you reflect on uh, your experience with gdpr if you travel to europe for example i can't do a simple google search easily each time i want to do a google search i have to accept a, a very i mean uh, that that uh, i'm okay with them using cookies etc so all that my personal opinion this will make me unpopular is that gdpr probably hasn't uh, accomplished what they set out to achieve because all consumers do there is something known as privacy paradox where we're sort of uh, diverting here but privacy paradox is all consumers say that uh, they want privacy but uh, in the blink of an eye they they without even reading they accept uh, the privacy terms and the terms of a <laughs> service of any app that you install so that is a privacy paradox so if if you sort of go by the stated consumer preferences rather than the real revealed consumer preferences i think this is what's called you end up with gdpr and companies like google etc which are large pocketed they have the resources for compliance legal compliance so the economic theory shows that uh, when you have a regulation that is difficult to comply to it ends up benefiting the large big guys not the small guys and innovation suffers so it's it's a complex field is what i'm saying <laughs> Okay, so I want to ask my last question. I think, and then Esther will ask one. Then copyright. So, so Sarah, so a couple of different strands to this. Sarah Silverman's suit and a couple of the other authors got four fifths of it got thrown out of court. But now the New York Times is suing. It seems to me on on more on firmer ground. But um, they could also strike a deal and pay OpenAI the way AP decided to make a deal with. with openai open um my theory is that the ap is paying a lot less than the new york times would pay so um i mean openai has to pay them a lot less than they would have to pay the new york times how is this copyright issue going to play out do you think so in the context of uh, op- the new york times lawsuit we're uh, hearing about the napster lawsuit right what happened with napster so so napster basically was uh, letting you download all uh, songs for free pirated music etc it didn't have the approval of uh, the recording studios and the album the artists etc so that over the years had uh, has led to the current streaming uh, models that we have so each time you listen to a song you you sort of uh, have to pay a cent or whatever it is the amount right so why wouldn't that work uh, when we use llms each time that is trained not when the users use but when llm so it seems to me only fair that uh, content particularly specialist content needs to be paid for so so that's uh, one of the things so again each country will differ japan for example so it's become a matter of national pride you mentioned about ai race it's not just between corporations but between countries as well so japan has said any trading data that is used for trading llms is not going to be subject to copyright so that's the approach japan is taking i don't know if that's going to hold up to the scrutiny of international content but in japan that's the law that they're making so so in india too i think uh, that would be the way it would lean and there is copyright issues of content the input training content then there are also copyrightability issues of the output itself is is that output being uh, plagiarized can we establish a, a link there do you need to have a human author uh, for copyrightability of those things the us courts are saying that you need to have a human authorship for something to be copyrighted or patentable some other jurisdictions are taking a different uh, view so how will this shake out i think uh, this goes back to your question of who's going to come out on tops so people who have the ability to pay those licensing and royalty fees for input content there is a a case going on between uh, getty images and i think uh, mid journey and uh, stable diffusion where getty images is saying that you've taken our images without permission while adobe doesn't have to <clears throat> face that claim because they've used on their own uh, images so these are uh, some of the issues and to to go back the same issues exist with code generators as well 
code generator. So, so that's why all uh, new, like if you go to these uh, portals or websites where artists display or upload their images, the terms of uh, service have been updated now to explicitly say in some portals that it may be used for training or may not be used for training. So that's uh, the way it is. I think, I mean, my view is uh, technology leads uh, regulation. So it's not possible to regulate for or do all these rules of engagement for technology that doesn't already exist. Another fascinating case is there was a very promising legal tech startup called Ross some time back. They used uh, Reuters uh, all uh, case and legal text to train. This is like this predates the generative AI things to train their machine learning models and build up their legal tech application. But Reuters uh, went to court and sued them and uh, Ross ultimately shut down because of that. So this is a case uh, of five, six years ago. So these are going to come into stark contrast if you're talking about uh, how 2024 and beyond is going to play out. These are the rules of engagement that I talked about which need to be framed. You keep mentioning um, the idea of basically the technology, and you're not the first person to say this, basically technology continues to be the one that needs to lead the um, regulation, which is um, interesting because it's kind of scary <laughs> to think that technology would be leading regulation. But uh, my final question is relating to what you're speaking before and what um, Sean is speaking is we recently spoke to um, NYU professors who brought up the idea of basically whoever's using the data you have to pay the person's data that you're using. Kind of like a this transactional ability of like, um, as the data is being used, I, if my data is used, then the company should be paying me, right? Do you think that's where we will end up basically when it comes to data laws, not only for like publications, but also like for even consumers themselves? See, somebody has uh, done a study on this. Like what's the value of all the data that we give to, say, a company like Facebook. So it said probably that came to a very small number, $50, $60 per year or so, the value of the... The counter argument to this thing of uh, you pay me for usage of my data, like if it's a marketing lead database, for example, it's much clearer uh, to make that argument. You are sending uh, to my marketing list. That, that's what we're used to, right? I have a marketing list. Tech Target, say, for example, has a marketing list of 50,000 or 100,000 subscribers. I'll put your ad in front of them. So you pay me for that. That usage of data is like well established and fair. But when your data is used uh, in a recommendation algorithm, and because of that, your quality of service, your user experience, you're deriving benefits out of that. So it's not like a one-way street when it comes to taking your data, but it can be argued, the argument can be made that it's a two-way street. You're also benefiting from it. So that's the counter-argument of the thing of pay me for my data. There, there are some experiments that have uh, been done. I mean, there's some natural experiments. Because everybody says this, this is like a fairly 10, 15-year-old argument saying that my data travels with me, my data, I, I need to have sovereignty over my data, etc. So there, there have been... Uh, no ads supported search engines, for example, because everybody was worried that Google is sucking all of our data. So instead of an ad supported model, can we have a subscription model? So those models haven't been very successful. I mean, if you tell me like, what is the most successful subscription based model that's out there? Probably in media, for example, that would be New York Times. But even then, like even Netflix has started uh, showing ads for some types of subscribers, etc. So the subscription revenue, my suspicion is that wouldn't be enough to cover the entire costs. So that's why ad, uh, it's unfortunate because if we had begun with uh, the internet, when the internet began 20, 30 years, 30 years ago, if we had a choice of both subscription and ad supported models, maybe we would have been more used to paying, thing, paying things for content rather than depending or assuming that everything is going to be paid for by the ads that are shown to us. Intuitively, I, I'd li li like if somebody is going to pay me for usage of my data, but the real world experience so far shows that uh, we may never uh, get there. This is going to close out, but I want to thank you, Kashyap, and I hope we didn't keep you up way too late. I have no idea what time it is where you are, but I hope it's oh, not it's too late. <laughs> These are fascinating questions, and they made me think a lot, so thank you for that. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Keshap. We really appreciate your time. And honestly, I, I love your views about the different countries, um, about responsible AI. So this was very um, invigorating. To our listeners, please catch up with Keshap on LinkedIn. He's very active on there. And please feel free to download, continue to download our previous episode, leave a review, um, and just tell more people about this podcast. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. See you. Thank you.